We have all heard these terms, Marxism, socialism, communism, and these terms are being debated in the media, but they still feel sort of theoretical and removed from our daily lives. Well, guess what? No longer. They are very intimately connected to yours and my daily lives, and I'm here to explain how. The reason I know a thing or two about this is because I grew up in the Soviet Union. I actually got a master's degree in economics in the Soviet Union, which means I studied Karl Marx, I wrote papers, I saw things with my own eyes, and I lived in two other countries that experimented with those ideas. So I can recognize a mile away how these ideas are actually penetrating American culture, how they're shaping our discussions, and how they're actually forming our future and the future of our children. You also wanna pay attention to this because you will learn how to distinguish a lie from a truth, which is central to your flourishing, our flourishing, our success, is aligning ourselves with how the world really works. A lot of these ideologies, they sip into culture and they're sort of rehashed as truth and they're just a lie. If you love this video, express it with a thumbs up, forward it to someone who needs to hear it. Here we go. The inspiration for this episode was a trip that I just took to Washington, D.C., where I spoke about this at a church service three separate times uh, by invitation of the lead pastor, Brett Andrews, who's a friend of mine. He's been inviting me to do this for a few years now because two, three years ago, I wrote this very detailed post on my newsletter, ChristianRayFlores.com. You can actually go there and search Marxism and you'll find the article that had a lot of resonance. It was sort of forwarded and emailed a bunch of times by a bunch of people. And the reason I wrote it is because I lived through the stuff and I was sort of appalled and alarmed at how many of these ideas have become sort of mainstream, used all over the place without people connecting the dots and actually seeing how these ideas translate into real life. So the structure of the post and the article that you can find at ChristianRayFlores.com is big idea, real life implementation, and this is how I lived through this along with millions of other people. I must say I'm not politically active publicly at all. This is probably the one topic that can be perceived as political, although I don't think it is. It's about truth that I speak freely about, actively about, and feel strongly about. And the reason for that is because I know what I speak of. I'm educated. I've lived in those environments. I know what it means. And I can recognize the language, as I said, a mile away. And I think Marxism is corroding the West in a very significant way. Now, I feel strongly about it now, and my risk now is some you know, negative comments on YouTube. My risk in 1996, when I took a stand for it, was way higher. At the time, I was a successful artist. I had a number one hit called Our Generation. And the Boris Yeltsin campaign, who was trailing in the polls the last time the Communist Party was coming back and actually was about to win, they, they took my music and they created an anthem out of it. So they used it a lot in the campaign. I was on television a lot. The downside at the time for me was not just, oh, my guy didn't win. It was basically losing my career was the best case scenario or worse. So I do have strong feelings about it. I'm not afraid to express them because this stuff is actually destructive. It's actually going to derail, destroy. And I want to educate as many people as possible about the dangers of it, how to recognize it, how to recognize the language, how to actually pull on the thread and help people understand this is where it comes from, although it sort of mutates and changes form and shape, and you can't even tell that this is Marxism, socialism, this is materialism, this is idolatrous stuff, okay? So without further ado, I'm going to give you some sort of high-level notes on what the stuff is, how to recognize it, and what kind of effect it may have in your life. One way to identify neo-Marxist ideas is how they perceive evil and the solution to evil, okay? There's suffering in the world. We all know this. It's an observable fact. Did you know that Charles Dickens was writing The Christmas Carol and Mar Karl Marx was writing The Capital around the same period of time in the same city, observing the same things? This the rise of industrialization in London, these terrible working conditions for the workers, these greedy capitalists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Obviously, it's self-evident that that was a bad thing. But Charles Dickens identifies sort of this archetype, Scrooge. And his solution for Scrooge was redemption, was a transformation from the inside out. Karl Marx looked 
at the same architect, the Scrooges, the capitalist, the bourgeoisie, he called them. And his solution was not transformation, it was elimination. Why is that important? How you can, can you recognize it now? Well, basically what you do is you not address the inside of a person that evil resides inside of us, and we have the capability to repent, be transformed. We have the capability to experience grace and be changed and live the rest of our lives one way. Or we are identified as evil, not as an individual, but as a group of people. So from that grows this identity politics thing. In Karl Marx's words, it's called class struggle. And it's basically the evils of the world are reduced to the bourgeoisie oppressing the proletariat. And the solution for that is to take the proletariat and create a dictatorship, not a free society, not a democratic society, but a dictatorship of the proletariat that would oppress, dismantle the bourgeoisie as a class. Do you see how you can weaponize that? You can take gender, color, all kinds of identity markers of a group of people, and then you can make them the evil, okay? And then you deal with them that way. And honestly, in one way or another, we're all Scrooges, right? I'm a Scrooge. I've done things that I'm ashamed of. I've done things that I regret. And what I love about being a Christian is that I can repent. I can see my errors. I can turn myself in. I can experience grace. I can be renewed. And I can live a very, very different life because that produces flourishing. It produces gratitude. It produces service and ministry. It produces worship. And the alternative is this shaming, dismantling language that separates people, that creates hate, that destroys it, that doesn't build up. So this is another way that you can recognize something on the ground right now in America. And you can pull at that thread and you can see where it comes from. Now, it may be using different language. It's not the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. But at the end of the day, it's the same stuff. This idea of painting a whole class of people as evil and then taking something from them forcefully brings disastrous results. I'll give you a real-life illustration. My great-grandfather, Lavrenty Petrovich Matvienko, he was a Ukrainian farmer, and during the years of collectivization, when this idea was implemented, basically, let's take everything from people who have anything and put everyone in collective farms, which, by the way, brought uh, about 10 million deaths through just starvation. Uh, that happened to him. So they took everything away from him. He was a lucky one because he didn't get shot. They exiled him and many, many thousands of others into other remote places. So he was in Siberia on the border with China. Fast forward to World War II. My grandmother with her three daughters were being evacuated from a city literally under Nazi bombardment. They made their way to Asia and then to the house of my great-grandfather. By then, this entrepreneurial guy in the middle of nowhere had a cow or two, he had some pigs, some chickens, he had a house. He fed literally the whole extended family, probably 20, 25 people, throughout the war when there was famine in the land. This guy was taking everything away from, and he rebuilt it all in just a matter of a few years, and he became a provider and savior for a whole extended family. If that doesn't illustrate just how flawed and evil these ideologies are when they're implemented in real life, I don't know what does. Another way to recognize some of these foundational ideas in modern America is this language, this rhetoric that is obsessed with people that have a lot of money and then painting the rest of us as these poor victims, right? And um, it doesn't serve anybody, actually. I don't want to be a victim. I don't want to feel like a victim. It doesn't help me grow or be inspired to grow. But if somebody tells me, you're a victim, you're a victim, you're entitled to this, you're entitled to that, uh, it's it's actually not a real, real view of economy. Economics don't work like that. Economies grow when people feel free, entrepreneurial, they serve each other, and economies grow. It's not a zero-sum game. The pie grows all the time. And ironically, the people that actually buy into this lie, those are the economies that stagnate. Those are the economies where everybody's poor and miserable, okay? I was reading literally lines lifted out of Karl Marx in Teen Vogue. I mean, it just blew me away. Here's another thing. These guys hate religion. They want to suppress it. They want to abolish it. They want to eliminate it, shrink it any, any way they can. Of course, this has never worked and never will because God has set eternity on man's heart. But this idea stems from Karl Marx. Religion is opiate for the people. 
everything we see is sort of this materialistic thing and the philosophy is called dialectic materialism and it basically completely rejects the reality that we are not only material beings but we're spiritual beings it rejects the reality that god exists a benevolent creator who has given us this spark right the spark of image bearers of God. All of these things are not even acknowledged, okay? And if they're not acknowledged, then we are just, you know, intelligent animals. Well, it's so much easier to do evil to intelligent animals, which is exactly what happened during the 20th century. About 100 million people died in the areas where Marxism was sort of ruling as an experiment, okay? And people like us, if we are God's people, if we know that God has authority over all men and the universe, if we are image bearers of God, you know, we're not easy to oppress. We just won't take it. Another destructive way how these ideology and philosophy starts creeping into culture is a shift from objective truth that we can all find together, debating, disagreeing with each other and arriving somewhere, and sort of the abandonment of, of that towards collective group truth, which basically means there's a group of people who, create, who can create their own truth and their truth will trump somebody else's truth, which is not truth then, right? But it's a very real illusion and lie, essentially, right? And people can buy into that. That's sort of the crazy thing. And what it creates is a propaganda machine. A propaganda machine is not a platform that tells truth and seeks the truth and discovers or even changes towards truth if they didn't have it before. But it's literally an instrument of a ruling collective and their truth, and their truth will trump everybody else's truth. So it is a terrible and destructive thing, right? In the Soviet Union, uh, they, of course, had no independent media whatsoever. Everything was owned by the government. And I remember how we would have these these shortwave radios and we would tune into the voice of america or bbc world service and they the soviets had tens of thousands of jamming stations to actually suppress the signal but they couldn't fully suppress it so we knew what kind of programs would come on at what time and we would just sort of in secret because it was illegal actually listen to these stations and the sound quality was terrible it was one of the ways what we got actually good music right because it was just terrible music we had no access to good music and we'll just get the latest hits from from the voice of america or bbc world service and the idea here is this this is where i'm telling you this is that truth is just truth and when somebody starts suppressing truth and creating this group identity truth that trumps everything else, that is a very dangerous thing because it leads to active propaganda machines. They amass power. They amass influence. They suppress everybody else. It's, it's, a, it's a very violent thing only through information. Here's another way to recognize the imprint of Marxism in our culture. When you start thinking about evil not being inside of somebody who can then repent, be redeemed, be transformed, but evil being attached to a group of people, well, well, how do you solve that evil? Well, you, you have an enlightened group of people over here who have identified them as evil, and they are there in charge to sort of rearrange things. They are collectively the Messiah, and usually they actually come up with an actual Messiah, which is like the great leader of some sort of Marxist nation, right? This, this uh, cult of personality thing happens. Uh, but this group of people is then charged to take from these people to redistribute everything, which is by definition violence, right, and force, because you're now infringing on people's good uh, free will, both on the people you're taking from and you're on the people you're giving to, theoretically. In real life, everybody's miserable, everybody's mediocre. That leads to sort of these people be in this, have this great power, and then because they're the messiahs, they're the solution, they have to sort of decide everything, so they have to control everything. It's a command and control system. Now that leads to centralized economy. Centralized economy leads to basically this rule of mediocrity, right? You go to a store out in the Soviet Union, you go to a store, you won't be hungry, but you see like two, three types of bread, one or two types of cheese, maybe. You see bananas, green bananas, you will stand in line for like an hour or two, right? Because uh, everything is planned terribly by a group of people who can't possibly know what the needs are on the ground to any significant extent, right? So it's mass producing everything, but in terrible quality.
uh, you'll you'll never see a Russian TV a TV set in a, a Target. Why? Because the ideology has so imprinted and impregnated the sort of the nation that even 30 years after communism, they still can't think of people as individuals and serve them well. They build tanks, they build killing machines, they build really good rockets because it's for the glory of the motherland, but they can't make a good toaster, okay? So this is the centralized economy thing. I'll give you an, another amazing illustration. I used to go to East Berlin when it was still East Berlin because I had a cousin there and we would cross to West Berlin. And he was like crossing from black and white to color, from scarcity to abundance. My sister and I would go straight to McDonald's because that was like the, the height of, of awesomeness. And um, this is a nation who were literally out of, they were separated for just a few decades, right? It's not a long time. They speak the same language. It's the same nation. Uh, they're the same people. And one side still produced amazing cars. I drive an Audi A6. I love my Audi A6. They produce Audi, they produce Mercedes, they produce BMW and many others. And the east side of, of, of Berlin, East Germany produced the Trabant. It's the same nation. Look it up. It's an atrocious death trap of a car, right? It's ugly, it's awful, it's noisy. And this is one system versus the other system, one ideology versus another ideology. And if that's not an illustration of the sort of the rule of mediocrity, the misery that, that this stuff produces, and how slowly but surely you can actually infiltrate uh, whole groups of people um, culturally and create this same level of mediocrity in a place like America, uh, it's just scary to me. So I want to give you as many illustrations as possible so you can start recognize, recognizing these things on the ground as they happen. Another way to recognize how this is slowly penetrating our culture is the severe limiting of individual freedoms. Think about this, connect the dots. If utopia can be only ushered by an elite group of people who will then sort of take away from these guys who are evil, just whatever the group is, and then make it better for everybody else, then it organically flows from that, that they should tell you what to do, they should be able to censor you, they shall be able to limit you for the greater good, right? So in the Soviet Union, you, you couldn't even move from one city to another unless you got permission from the state. So you can't live in Moscow unless you have this thing called the prapiska. The prapiska is essentially your visa to be in that place, your, your right to live in this city. You couldn't move from city to city, let alone leave the country. Now, this is seems like an extreme thing, but think about this. How often do ideas get introduced about, for example, during COVID, having some sort of COVID passport that allows you to go from here to there, or from leaving your house? Uh, the, the, the parallels are not, uh, not complicated, right? And what happens with that as a next step, censorship as well, right, um, is this normalized, slowly normalized fear of the state. In countries that have sort of Marxist roots, you are afraid of the state. It's in the air. It's primal. It's an imprint. And I remember moving to, to, the, to the States and feeling that I'm unafraid of the government. And perhaps it's slightly naive, and it's all obviously in comparison. But my point is the baseline of fear of the state is very, very low in America. And I think it's becoming higher and higher, slowly but surely. And I want you to be able to recognize the trend, right? Because the trend is the direction where things can go. And then if you recognize the trend, you can actually do something about it, right? Okay, I got to wrap it up. I can talk about this all day. Thank you for watching all the way through. Give us a thumbs up. Leave some questions in the comments. I try to answer all of them. Thank you again for watching. I'll see you next time.